Right now, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout is on hold currently while the country's scientists decide on the best way forward. The AstraZeneca vaccine has shown in a trial of 2,000 young healthy people to be hardly more effective than a placebo in combating the new variant. It's not yet known if AstraZeneca will prevent severe infection with the new variant. However, there still seems to be some merit, perhaps, in using it to prime the body's antibody response. At the same time, there's hope that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is more effective against the variant in our country. Well, let's talk now to Professor Salim Abdul Karim, co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. Good evening, Professor. Thank you very much for your time. When should we restart this vaccine rollout? Good evening, Sally, and good evening to all of the viewers. So let's just go back one step. When we uh, developed the COVID-19 vaccine strategy, one of the components was to ensure diversity in the vaccines that we were bringing on board. And so three vaccines have been selected, as you know, the Johnson & Johnson, the Pfizer, and the AstraZeneca. And there are several more being considered. So eventually, we're going to have several vaccines. What's important is that we don't choose only one vaccine, but use many. So if there's a problem with one in manufacturing or in effectiveness, we've got others to fall back on. Now, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which had been shown to be effective against hospital and mild disease in the UK, Brazil, and uh, including some of the data from South Africa. So based on that, we proceeded. It's now become apparent that it's not as effective against the 501YV2 variant. And the problem is that the study was small and only included the young people. And so we only have evidence on mild infection. So now, we have uncertainty about whether the AstraZeneca vaccine reduces hospitalization and severe disease. And so that's why there's now been a delay in the rolling out of the AstraZeneca, because we don't want to end up giving a million people a vaccine that doesn't prevent hospitalization. We'd rather start in a stepwise way, giving it to 100,000 people, assessing, does it work? If it does, then we scale it up. If it doesn't, then we change tactic and go to another vaccine. Now, we're not really uh, impacting that much on the start of the vaccine rollout program because we have another vaccine. As I said to you, we wanted diversity. So we have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's being rolled out on a similar time frame to what we had originally worked on for AstraZeneca. All right. So talk to me about the specifics of that similar time frame because Johnson & Johnson, I think, is only just getting its licensing. When is it going to come to South Africa? When is it getting into people's arms? What's the time frame? Are we talking days or weeks? Maybe a month. Right. So the details, you know, you'll have to deal with the Department of Health because they are doing the implementing. We just provide the scientific advice. But I'll tell you what I do know. As far as I'm aware, the way in which the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is being rolled out is under what we call a phase 3B implementation study. So there's no placebo, it will be rolled out, mm. but it's done so under research conditions. And at this point, somewhere between 300,000 and half a million doses uh, are being made available, and these will be only for the initial group that qualifies, and that's healthcare workers. And the time frame for that, I'm led to believe that the vaccines are supposed to arrive within the next week or so, roughly in a similar time frame, maybe a day or two or three difference between the start date originally scheduled and what we'll eventually end up with for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You mentioned 100,000 people might still receive the AstraZeneca vaccine almost as a large study. Um, those people, won't they feel like guinea pigs? I mean, isn't it essentially a large trial of a vaccine that might not help us at all? So it's exactly the opposite. It's anything but a guinea pig experiment because there is no placebo. Anyone who's coming into the study gets the active vaccine. If it works, they've got a protective vaccine. If it doesn't work, then we will give them an alternate vaccine to ensure that they are protected. So it's a win-win situation for anybody coming into it. Remember, 
South Africa has been a key part of doing clinical trials on vaccines. And in those clinical trials, we had no idea whether the vaccines work at all. And you're not even sure whether you're getting placebo or the active vaccine. So the idea of volunteerism in order to obtain scientific data to benefit the entire community is a very fundamental part of the research paradigm. Sure. Will you be asking people to volunteer to take these hundred thousand, this 100,000 group for the AstraZeneca? Are you asking people to volunteer? Will you be targeting people in a specific group? Would you take it? So as it stands, the way in which it's, you know, it's going to be rolled out has still to be worked out. That's one of the points that the minister uh, commented on, that we uh, need to work out the details. Remember, we only found out about the research study that uh, found, made this finding just about, what, four or five days ago. So part of the task that the minister has given the Ministerial Advisory Committee on vaccines is to work out exactly the details that you're asking. Who should get it, when they should get it, where should they get it, all of those details about this stepwise approach. We can't just figure that out overnight. There needs to be a lot of thought consultation. So that group is meeting every day in order to put the details into this overall plan. And so that's where we want to move forward. It was a very interesting report that my colleague Maseho Ratlacha put together a little earlier, and she spoke to nurses and healthcare workers and got their more emotive response. And it was really, really interesting because one of the nurses said, we knew about this variant before we ordered the AstraZeneca vaccine. Granted, we didn't know about this latest study, but we knew there was a chance that the vaccine wouldn't work on this new variant. Why did we go ahead and order it anyway? And now that we have, can't we get our money back? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we will get questions like that from people who simply don't understand the complexity of the process. So if you take the current study on the AstraZeneca vaccine, that study started in June and July of last year. It takes seven months. So in response to this individual, I think the appropriate thing this person would like us to do is now that we know there's a new variant, is to do a study on AstraZeneca and the new variant. And that would mean it would take us about seven, eight months, mm. which would mean that they would only get vaccines in August of September this year. Now, if people were willing to wait that long, Yes, we would do these studies and sure. we'd do them on all of the vaccines. Gotcha. The truth is that it's not practical or feasible. We have to find other ways in which to do I, it. I mean, you're kind of trying to fix the aeroplane while it's flying, I suppose, in a way. Is the AstraZeneca vaccine a write-up? And I, the reason I ask that is it actually works really well for the original strain of COVID-19. Um, but is it a bit of a write-off in your mind now? Or could it still surprise us? Because if it's not doing very well in preventing mild to moderate infections in healthy youngsters. Is it probably very likely that it won't do very well at all in stopping severe or hospitalization cases with the new variant? So Sally, that's a very good question. And in fact, it's exactly that uncertainty that has crept in. What do we know about the way the immune system prevents different kinds of disease? So for mild disease, generally, you would expect a vaccine not to prevent asymptomatic or very mild disease because uh, in order for the vaccine to work, the infection has to take place. And that's when the immunity kicks in and the antibodies kick in. But the prevention of mild disease is largely a, an antibody-based response. For severe disease, it's the combined uh, activities of both T cells and antibodies. So it's a slightly different set of immune parameters that impact on severe disease. So that's why it's difficult to predict. That's why we can't simply extrapolate from mild disease to severe disease because they are different things at work here. And that's exactly what's created this uncertainty. All right, so tell us about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That, has it been tested on the new variant here in South Africa? Has it been shown to be really effective? 
Exactly. So while the uh, study that was done on AstraZeneca had only 2,000 people and didn't have any hospitalizations and only included young people, the, as the uh, study that was done on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was the was a large study that was included at least a third of the people who are over 65. So now we have very sound evidence in terms of the safety of that vaccine and its efficacy across the different ages. It also measured efficacy against mild disease and severe disease. And what did it show? It showed 85% protection against severe disease and hospitalization. Now that's really an excellent result. And that result is against the 501YV2 variant because that study was done in South Africa. It was done in the setting where 501 was the predominant uh, virus. So we're much more confident in this vaccine. There are also other advantages. One is that this is a single dose vaccine. So unlike the other vaccines which require two doses, this is only one dose. The second is that it's very easy to store because it just stays in the fridge like normal vaccines do. And the third, it's pretty low cost as uh, you know, it's even cheaper than the AstraZeneca vaccine because the AstraZeneca vaccine needs two doses, so mm -hmm. it's double the price. So there are many pluses to this particular vaccine. All right, so clearly already the virus uh, has shown us flames, as the youngsters say. It's managed to make, mutate past some of the vaccines that have proven effective up to now. Nothing really, I suppose, to stop it doing that again. But in terms of developing booster shots to deal with new variants, is it going to get easier and easier? Has, has all the difficult groundwork been done in developing a technique to somehow uh, evade this uh, virus, or is it really back to square one as soon as there's a new variant? So that's the good thing about the way in which vaccines have been developed, in that we now have the backbone technology. And all we need to do is to change the insert. Now, it's easier with some kinds of vaccines. For example, with a vaccine like the Pfizer vaccine or Moderna, where it's an mRNA, those are actually quite easy to do. Well, not quite easy. It's complicated science, but as science goes, this is relatively easy and something that can be done in about six to eight weeks, as opposed to doing this with a more live virus vector vaccine, because that takes a lot longer. That will take three months or so. Now, these booster shots are going to be designed specifically to tackle the 501Y V2 variant. So they should be quite effective against this particular variant. So when they come along, then those booster shots will be the basis on which we will protect against the new variant. So this problem we have about the current set of vaccines and not knowing full well how they work against the 501 is a temporary problem. We have it just for this while. Once we have the boosters, then that problem is taken care of. Of course, the problem then becomes as we resolve the immunity against the 501YV2 variant, there's likely to be a new variant. Mm. And so we're going to play this tit for tat. We make a vaccine to try and kill the virus. The virus figures out a way to bypass it. So this is going to be the challenge that science is going to have to rise to. And as I said, it's a battle between virus and humankind. And I'm a firm believer that because humankind has science on its side, we will win. You know, it's so interesting that you say, uh, you know, we have science on our side. And I think that uh, the transparency with which this has been dealt with, uh, that the scientific community has been very open, that they don't have all the answers and that things uh, present challenges that were not expected and then you have to think again and make a new plan. But unfortunately one of the, the, the byproducts of that is that people who have vaccine hesitancy are now getting even more frightened. You know, even some of those nurses were saying, I'm not sure it's safe. And someone uh, sent me a message uh, on Twitter saying, please ask the professor if he would take the AstraZeneca vaccine in public. So I'm going to ask you, would you? I think the issue about which vaccines each person will take is something that needs to be resolved in relation to their priority. 
Remember, you've already asked me this question, and I already gave you the answer to it. So I will wait my turn, and I will take whatever vaccine is offered when it's my turn. I would qualify under the elderly, unfortunately, so I'll have to wait my turn in the second phase of the rollout of the vaccine. I don't know what vaccine is going to be available then. And finally, what is your message to the healthcare community? They were so hopeful that finally they'd be able to make headway. And I'm sure you're aware of how very difficult this last year has been for them. What is your message to them tonight? I think we have to understand that last year was very difficult. And part of that difficulty was the level of uncertainty. When we discovered that vaccines were effective, that resolved some of that uncertainty. We had a pathway forward. Now, when December, when we first described the variants, we realize now actually the vaccines are just not a simple solution. And so we now have new uncertainty. We have to deal with uncertainty. And part of dealing with uncertainty is to know that there will be a path forward. It might not be always clear initially, but if we look at the path forward in terms of the vaccines we have, as I've already explained, for example, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, very effective against the 501YV2 variant. We're going to find all of the other companies, including AstraZeneca, making booster shots that they will use so that their vaccines will also be effective. So that's our path forward. And if we stick with that path, we know we would, can defeat this virus because we can do it because we have a prevention toolbox. We have our masks, we have our social distancing, we have our vaccines. Using all of them together, we can hopefully make a big impact on the next waves that are coming. Well, thank you so much for your time this evening. Always a great pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Thank you so much. That was uh, Professor Salim Abdul Karim, co-chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee 